grab your Bibles and turn with me this morning to Ruth. Amen. Maybe to some familiar passage of Scripture. And uh, the story of Ruth in general is great. And uh, there's a lot to be uh, gained from it. I uh, want to look at probably a part that we've looked at before through the years, but hopefully... Uh, it will be something fresh and new as we look at it in a new way. All right. Amen. Let me just read. Let's jump down to verse number 14, and I'll give you the background if you're not familiar with this. If you are, just be patient with me till I get a background link for everybody. Amen. Verse number 14. Do you have to see Tim and Rebecca here with us this morning? Amen. Last time I saw them, they were two, but now they're one. What's that? Chapter. Chapter number one, Ruth chapter number one. Sorry, I, I have a way of jumping thoughts, right? Chapter number one. So I want to congratulate you, Sam and Rebecca. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Verse number 14, the Bible says, And they lifted up their voice, and they wept again, and Martha kissed her mother-in-law, and Ruth played under her, and she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law is, is God. Uh, back to her, unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou diest, I will die, and there I will be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more so, if aught but death part thee and me. When she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. Amen. One thing that we need to be in our service to serving God is steadfastly minded. Steadfastly minded. Let me give you a little bit of story about what's happening here and maybe even be able to reframe a little bit for you. Uh, we know that there is famine that has come to Bethlehem, Judah. Uh, and in the middle of famine, and here we have a man named Elimelech, his wife, Naomi, their sons, Macon and, 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 and Chilion. Uh, I'll pronounce it my way, maybe a little bit different for some of you. Amen. But uh, uh, with ease, I'll say uh, Malon and, and Chilion. And so uh, when we look at this, automatically our minds think that there is famine. And our minds think, well, they must be in a drought or they must be in a time that, you know, I hear folks complain about now where there's so much water, you can't plant and get things to grow. But however, historians have indicated that this famine could have very well been by the, by the raiding of the Philistines and the Am Ammonites. As they come in, you would find that they come in and, and, and took the harvest from these folks in Bethlehem, Judah. Now, can you imagine the, the dismay uh, of, of folks? They are, uh, they are, they, it's not like they go down to Walmart and they buy their food. Uh, things are a lot different in these day, this day and age. You raise your food for what you're going to eat. Sure, there are markets, and sure you barter, but the life is a lot different than we know it as today. And so they go out to their land, and there they are. They're plowing, and then they plant, and they're cultivating. And then how about all that irrigation? It wasn't done by hoses on a switch, but the irrigation was done as they brought water to their plants, and they, 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 they saw the increase. And uh, as you do all that work, that's a lot of work. In your garden... I mean, it's a lot of work. If you're going to keep up with the garden, the weed, and to keep things going right, keep the ground hogged out, keep everything going good, all the pests and everything, and that's a lot of work to have a lot of dismay to realize that the enemy has come in and they took what you have worked for. And if this happens year after year after year, wouldn't it get a bit discouraging? Would you be discouraged? I would be discouraged. And so, so much that uh, they found that uh, Elimelech and Naomi decides that they're going to leave the land that God has promised them and wanted them to be at. And they journey down to Moab. 
Now, sometimes the Christian life can be discouraging. Amen. Life don't always go the way that we like. I've said it before, it rains upon the just and the unjust. Sometimes we're treated this fair, uh, unfairly. Sometimes we're misrepresented. Sometimes things happen that we don't like, but God's plan is bigger and God knows what He's doing. But we can feel like the enemy has come in and stolen everything that we've worked for. Sure, life can feel that way. Can rob you of your joy, rob you of your peace, or rob you, you know, if we allow. So here it is that the that, that, that Lemonite decides he's going down to Moab. And as they go down to Moab, they find that there's job security. And they find that there is some support that is there for them. And they're feeling pretty comfortable as they journey away from where God really anticipated and designed for them to be. But they go away and they find some security. It even gets better so much security that both of their sons finds wives. Melon Chilion finds wives, wonderful wives, and there they are uh, marrying the daughters of Moab. And, and from all appearances, it looks like Elimelech and Naomi have begun to major their success on a greater scale than what it's been in Israel when they were in Bethlehem, Judah. If you're not careful, amen, and you get your eyes off of real, of what real success is, hello, Real success and what real success is. Amen. If we get our eyes off of where God wants us to be, we can begin to measure by the world's measurement and we can be far from where God desires and has designed for us to be. And so, really, when I look at Elimelech and Naomi, this is where they are. They're looking successful, but this was not where God wanted their success to be. And so, you know, as, 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 as they're there, all of a sudden, the first decade begins to go good, but then disaster starts happening. Elimelech gets sick, and he dies. It's much, not much longer in which, if we don't in a strange land add insult to injury, that Naomi finds herself without a husband, she still has her son and daughter-in-law, still not the same as having the big family all around her back in Bethlehem, Judah. But she finds that her sons are getting sick as well. And they die. So here she is, is and she's left in the strange uh, 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 land. Now, how do we measure grief? How do we look at grief? You know, uh, uh, to lose a parent may be one thing if they're a, a older in age, but we still struggle with that, don't we? Still the, the longing, the missing, the wanting, the grief, the process. But to lose a spouse, that life partner that God designed for you to be with, can be quite uh, a paralyzing when you lose them. And so Naomi is going through this. And I don't know everything that she's going through, but she's feeling the sting of this death. Uh, uh, but then the unexpected happens that shouldn't happen. You know, that of parents burying their children. That's just... That's not the way it registers in our mind. We think that parents, uh, uh, their children bury them, not parents bury their children. And so this grief that she has all combobulated, if you would, is, uh, is, is, is quite something. And then she's away from the known support of a nation that really knows a God is a God of all comfort. So she's in this land where, where there's really no real comfort uh, as she knows what true comfort is. So amidst all this, she begins to turn her eyes and certainly her heart back toward Bethlehem, Judah. And uh, the Bible indicates that it's a very difficult picture because she has known the past decade of being with Orpha and, and, and Ruth. And, and as she makes her way, Brother David, along the road, it's a difficult journey. Can you imagine everyone who's been close to her? She's had her husband. She's had her sons. They've been there a long time. But a decade is nothing to sneeze at as she's been with her two daughter-in-laws as well. They have a relationship built. And so there she's traveling back and her daughter-in-law says, Hey, we're going to go with you back to Bethlehem, Judah. And 
And so as they're making their way back, uh, 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 it's the only place where they, uh, 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 Naomi feels that she can find peace of mind and peace of heart as she begins to travel back. And so as she travels back, she talks to her two daughter-in-laws and she says, listen, why don't you all go on back? Uh, 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 really, there's nothing for you. She gives a scenario. She has children. Would you want to wait for my sons to grow up and marry them? You're going back to a land where you're Gentiles. You're not going to be accepted. It's going to be very difficult for you. And so we know the story. There's this mourning. There's this cry. There's this tug of war. There's this challenge. I mean, it's a real crisis moment for, 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 for Naomi, but also for Orpha and Ruth, who are her, her daughter-in-laws. And so in Orpha's heart, she begins to think, uh, you know, she's right. Uh, I, I, I don't serve her, God. Uh, my, my, my people are different. I think I'm going to go back. I want you to think about that moment where there's a kiss and there's a clinging. In our relationship with God, there's nothing left in the land of Moab. The land where we came from, the land of idolatry, the land of worldliness, the land of unrighteousness, the land of the ungodly. There is nothing there. And, and, and Naomi had went back there looking for answers and she took her son and it affects her whole family. Can I tell you what? When you go wandering in this world for your answers, it not only affects you but your families and for those who will be joined to your family and future generations. I'm preaching the truth. The thing that is established and will keep all families is the Word of God, the Kingdom of God, and the relationship with God, and living in a place where God wants us to live. And so here it is that, that uh, 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 Orpha is struggling. The gods of Moab ruled her. The gods uh, 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 of Moab had a pull on her life, and so uh, she. But 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 uh, Naomi, uh, Naomi realized something that she had experienced revival in a relationship with God, and she knew what a relationship with God can do. There was nothing in the world that would help her right now. Stop. Look and listen. Where are you in your life? Whatever your situation, there is nothing in the world that will give lasting answers and peace and help you. Everything that you need is found in Jesus Christ. The peace that you need, the comfort that you need, the strength that you need, the direction that you need, just the very companionship that you need is found within God and the kingdom of God. <coughs> and so, Moab, it's ultimately a land of wanderers. There's no one that, that really ever finds a good place. And so here it is. I want to ask you this question. When it comes to your relationship with God, are you kissing Him or are you cleaving to Him? So here are three women there are two daughter-in-laws, Orpha and Ruth, and there is Naomi. And Ruth is cleaving to her mother-in-law. It looks like it's tight. It looks like it's intimate. But it really looks intimate when Orpha kisses her mother-in-law. It's not about the way it looks. It's the way it's experienced. Amen. You can say, well, I'm clinging and looking like I'm close to God. You can look like you're close enough to kiss Him, but you can walk away and go back to the land of wandering where there's never answers, there's never peace, there's never real contentment. And so here it is that Orpha walks away and she wanders back to the land of Moab, that place of discontentment where she's always looking for something but never finds an answer. Moab is the place where you walk by sight. You never allow faith to grab hold in your heart and allow faith to be what guides you and directs you. Moab is a place of constant instability and double-mindedness. You never make your mind up to serve Christ. You're constantly riding the fence. Moab is a place where, where well, what, what there's dying, just ask a little like it, Mayon and Kilion. It's a place of death. There's no life there. But all oh, ask Ruth, Ruth and ask Naomi 
what happens in Bethlehem, Judah, when life seems to be all over, God breathes new life again into those who trust and follow after Him. Moab is that place where it's returning to no life and it's under the rule of self forever. Oh. See, it's kind of like being in that place where, 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 where uh, Judas was at the Last Supper. He kisses Jesus, but he walks away and then he finds himself in so much despair he takes his life. It's kind of like being in that place where Eve, she lost paradise for just a little bit of a taste of fruit. Amen. That is what Moab is like. And so, the values of finding that we need to have a mind made up and we need to go for the things of God. Look at Lot's wife. She turned back because of an unmade up mind and she was turned to a pillar of salt. We look at the Word of God. What ruined Demas? Demas has forsaken us having loved this present world. It didn't have to be that way. And so Joshua says, and if it seems evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your father that you served on the other side of the floods, or the god of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Can I tell you that I'm preaching to a church that I just want to say this this morning. Amen. Make up your mind for Jesus Christ. Amen. That everything about your life, amen, is that God will get the glory. I'm not going to stray down here where it looks like I can have the world's wealth and where I can prosper, but I'm going to stay in the place where God wants me to stay so that God's blessing will be upon my life. Ruth's decision, it was an amazing decision. It was so different than Orpha. It was all a matter of of desire. What did she say to her mother-in-law? No. No, Naomi. Where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I'm going to lodge. And your people, I may be a Gentile, but your people, they're going to be my people. And where thou diest, there I'm going to die. I'm going to be buried also. I want you to think about this. Ruth was determined to leave Judah, to go on to Judah and to leave Moab behind. Amen. And because of that, she enters the great halls of history. Think about that this morning. She enters the great hall of history. Sister Dietrich, her history changes. She goes from just being Ruth the Moabites to being Ruth of the lineage of Jesus Christ. Amen. Sometimes we have to leave the comfortable behind and we have to say, listen, as comfortable as, as, as it is, I have to trust God that God is leading me in my life. I'm not going to hold on to worldly possessions. I'm not going to hold on to living life just comfortably. But I'm going to give my all to Jesus Christ. Amen. It seemed against her origin because she was from Moab. It seemed that, that, that it was against her past. She was a widow. Would she find a husband here? You know what? God can change our past. It doesn't matter how dirty, how ugly, how future it is. Amen. God says, I am grafted to the body of Christ. <coughs> Church is not a museum for saints. It is a hospital for sinners. So Jesus says, enter in. And so it was against even her own sister-in-law's choice. But she said, I will make a choice to follow after God. Right here, right now, her future was at stake. Do you know your future is at stake? Are you going to choose Jesus? Are you going to serve Him? No matter what, Amen. God changes all those things. And so, right here, right now, I want you to think it through. What direction are you going to go? You see, it wasn't an impulsive decision that Ruth made, but it was a, it was a decision of conviction. It's easy to go back to Moab. But I have conviction that I want to go to Bethlehem, Judah. 
Because I've seen enough of my husband, my father-in-law, my brother-in-law, and certainly my mother-in-law that I want the God of Bethlehem Judah. I'm tired of wondering. I'm tired of indecisions. I'm tired of double-mindedness. I'm tired of just a place where idols are worshipped. They have ears, but they can't hear you. They have mouths, but they can't speak. They have eyes, but they can't see. So I'm trusting God with this, and, and, and I'm moving on. See, sometimes, sometimes the gate that we enter through, it isn't high and prestigious. Sometimes it's rusty, and sometimes it's warm. But when God says, enter through the gate, we've got to go. Because God still works and performs miracles in lives. Can you trust God? Can you trust God? Let me grab my iPad for a minute. I just need to look up a guy's name and go home and Google him. I enjoy looking at the news this morning as I read about a man, Reverend Philip Dunn, D-U-N-N. Let me tell you a little bit about Philip Dunn. Does anyone know anything about something called macular degeneration? Some folks know about that. If you're diagnosed with this, I don't want to scare you because God's got a miracle. The macular degeneration is that where you can't see and that hole gets bigger and bigger and bigger and it takes your sight away. And I've worked around a lot of folks who've had macular degeneration and they've had it for a long time. I've seen them as the disease progresses and it's, it's unfortunate because the vision is gone. They can inject your eye, they can do things now to, to sustain it, but, but once it's, it's gone, it's very difficult. So as I told you about Reverend Dunn, he was diagnosed with macular degeneration. He lost his sight. But for 14 years, he believed that God would heal him. He's from Charleston, West Virginia, as I said. Look it up. Research it for yourself. I'm not telling you a fairy tale. I'm telling you the truth. And so he goes to the eye doctor. He can't see. His daughter has gotten married some time ago. She's not, he's not really seen her wedding. He's not seen his son-in-law. He's not seen his grandchildren. He always desired to take a trip to California, a road trip. But there was no purpose now because the macular degeneration had destroyed the vision in his eyes. He started having some problems. He goes to the eye doctor. Even though he has the macular degeneration, he's considered legally blind. And as he goes... They discovered that there is a rupture uh, cataract on his eye, and, and, and they say that needs to come off. Now, the cataract has nothing to do with macular degeneration. If you're blind, you're blind. But he gets the cataract removed from his eyes, and guess what? He can see. He gets the other cataract removed from his eyes, and guess what? He can see. He said, that is my miracle. For 14 years, I held on to this. They told me that I would never see again, that I would be blind. He said, but I preached my first sermon using my notes, and I preached on the blind man. He said, God still does miracles. We can live in the land of indecision. We can live in the land where we're just surviving. But God is calling us all the time to a better place that He has designed for us to live. Amen. Just as God had called Ruth out of Moab, amen, He calls each one of us out of lower living and says, I have a better place for you to sit, a better frame of mind, a better hope, a better faith. Amen. I want you to move over here. But it has to be our decision. God's not looking for impulsive decisions where people are flippant and go without faith and without trust and without conviction. God is looking for men and women who will say with conviction, I will move and live in the place that God has designed for me. Oh, can I tell you that there is a reward for those people who will move with God? Amen. Ruth's story doesn't just end with that decision. But to give you a very quick synopsis of her life, as Sister Holly comes to the piano, amen, God's choice for Ruth was this, that there was a man in Bethlehem, Judah, by the name of Boaz, who was a near kinsman redeemer, that when they were struggling for food, he created a place for her. He told his workers to drop hands fools on purpose for her and that lady one day becomes his wife and she becomes of the lineage of King David and even a greater king yes. named Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus. My message for us this morning is this. 
is God as you destined for greatness. I'm not talking measured greatness as the world measures, but God has spiritual greatness for you. But it comes down to a choice. Others may leave and choose to live in the land of the world. But the choice is real for you this morning. Will you choose to rise up in faith and say, I'll oh, to choose Jesus? I'll choose Jesus. I'll choose Jesus. I'll choose to live differently. I'll choose to talk differently. It's a choice. The choice can't be flippant because it's a tough choice. The easy choice is going back to the world and living the way that they live. Living for the moment, living for the season, living for the fun. When God says there's a walk to walk and there's a place to go. The place to go may not be easy. There's an old house that needs fixing up. You're going to have to work at it. There's going to be gleaning in a field that is not your own. You're at the mercies of others. But you finally drop hands full on purpose for you. And the big picture is this, is that He has a plan for your life. You can trust Him with the plan. He's the great designer. A little over a week ago, I was challenged, I'm closing with this because I see the time. I was challenged by another minister. They said, you go to every visit that you go to and you look at someone and you can talk to them about Jesus Christ and you can tell them that God can make this part of the plan for them. How do you go to those who are abused emotionally, physically, sexually? How do you look at them and say this is a part of God's plan? How can you? In that moment, I thought, how can I not? Is it God's plan that someone's mistreated or done wrong? No, never. No, never. But we live in a fallen world. And to those who are unjustly treated, I can say that God can take that and He can turn those wounds into scars that will represent His glory of the magnificent power of His healing. The wounds may be deep emotionally of things that's happened to you, but God can heal every emotional wound. Don't you walk away and go living in the land of always wondering. Take your wound to Jesus. Amen. You can trust Him with every area of your life. And so the message that I offer you, every one of you, as diverse as it may be in here, because God writes each of our stories individually. Some of them have very painful moments in them. Some of them have moments that would be shocking. Some of them have moments that we like to erase. But I need to tell you that God writes that story so that He can write His story in you. So the choice is yours this morning. Would you journey to a land where God gives victory? Don't return back to the land of wandering. But this morning, the doorway is open. Go through the gate. The gate leads to a land of greater opportunity. All those who want greater opportunity, would you step through the gate and enter into the presence of God this morning? Let's gather in for a season of prayer today. together in, would you say, God, no more undecisiveness. I'm not going to be double-minded. I'm not making the choice just impossibly, but I'm making the choice of commitment that I trust you with everything about my life. My life is in your hands.